accompanied by survivors and their loved ones. Um, also, in a lineup from 6 to 7.30 is a study break um, where there will be an open mic, good food, uh, I think Reiki, and other things. Can everyone hear me? Um, this Wednesday from 4 to 5 in Women's Studies, Education 332, um, Disability, Difference, and Inclusion will present their social action project. Cookies, cupcakes, and hot beverages will be served. Next Wednesday from 11.30 to 2.30 p.m. is the Women's Studies Study Break. There will be lunch and activities like Reiki, crafts, tarot cards, and coloring. And then be on the lookout for a survey of our fall brown bag series. Um, we want your feedback, and the survey link will be emailed in our outreach email and posted on our Facebook page. Um, if you have to leave during today's presentation, please um, be quiet and bring your trash. Um, there's compost in the back. Um, and then if you could also please put your chairs back after you finish the and thanks for being here. <laughs> and so uh, Dina Robinson is a graduate from the class of 2012. And at, during her time at Colgate, she was very involved in women's studies, both as an intern and a chairwoman of sort, and in many other things. Um, now she's a law student at University of Maryland and is joining us from Baltimore to share her insights about navigating the professional world uh, through a womanist feminist lens. And if you have other things, um, please. <laughs> okay, hi you guys. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm so sorry that I couldn't be there in person. I really planned to, but law school exams are kind of ruining my life right now. Um, but I wanted to Skype in anyway because I miss the Women's Studies Center so much and Women's Studies was such a huge, important part of my life while I was at Colgate. Um, so I wanted to start out by telling you guys a bit about what I did while I was at Colgate and how that translates into the work I'm doing now. Um, so during my first year at Colgate, I was hit with an extreme uh, culture shock my freshman year. Um, because we had a racial incident that took place on campus right after Barack Obama was elected president. And it filled me with um, a sense of, I wouldn't call it rage, anger that I don't think I had ever experienced in my life because I don't consider myself to be an angry person. Um, and when that happened, for like a couple of months, after it happened, I was walking around on the campus, and I was just like, if God does not get me off of this campus, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what other people are going to do, but I'm like losing it. Um, and then I found the Women's Study Center. I honestly, my memory is so bad right now of like my freshman year that I don't even remember how I ended up in the Women's Study Center. But um, I remember walking in one day, and I was greeted by the program assistant, who was working there at the time, Liz Thompson, who I hope if you guys haven't met, you get a chance to meet her. Um, and I walked in and I was just like, I'm so angry, help me. And so I sat in her office um, and we started talking about everything that had happened on campus and then I became a regular in the Women's Study Center. Um, also around that time, um, I had a lot of friends at Colgate who had been sexually assaulted and a group of um, upperclassmen and I got together to start trying to revise the sexual assault policy. Um, so those two things came together for me at the same time. And I know that um, currently Colgate's going through another um, wave of, I don't know, I don't even know what to call it. Um, <laughs> a way of like not responding well to victims of violence, um, not responding well to racial issues. And I just want to let you guys know that honestly, Cody will continue progressing even if you have to kick it, like or drag it kicking and screaming towards progress. It's gonna happen eventually. Um, because my freshman year, the sexual assault policy and grievance process that is at Colgate now wasn't there when I was a freshman. Um, and it was so it was so bad. 
it was horrible. And um, we did a lot of work to get it to a better place. So I'm saddened to hear that things at Colgate are the way that they are right now. But I can tell you that probably in like another two or three years, when you guys have graduated, um, everything will be better again. And I think things tend to hit Colgate in waves for whatever reason. Um, so after I'd done work on the sexual assault policy, I met this attorney, Brett Sokolow, and I was working with him and he was like consulting with Colgate on um, helping with this process. And I was just like, how do I do the work that you do? And he was like, go to law school. So then I was like, okay. But when I was at Colgate, I'd been pre-med. Um, and I'd want, I, I kind of wanted to go to law school, but I don't think I was super serious about it. Um, so after I graduated, I taught in Baltimore. Um, and teaching in Baltimore and doing the sexual assault works at Colgate is kind of what got me into law school. Um, so this is where the womanist, feminist stuff comes in. Um, so when I was teaching, I was teaching English to speakers of other languages, pre-K through 12th grade. Um, and every time I would tell people that, they'd be like, in the same room? And I was like, no, not in the same room, just in different small groups. Um, and I, the one thing that I think women's studies taught me is to not always play by the rules and that it's okay sometimes to be a rule breaker. Um, in a, you know, in the most polite of ways. But, um, the curriculum in my school district for English language learners was the most horrible thing I've ever seen. And I had an eighth grade student and, and the curriculum for him was um, like, A is for apple, B is for bear. And I was just like, this child is in eighth grade. I'm not doing this with him. He's not a pre-K student. He's not in kindergarten. We're going to do something different. So I scrapped the curriculum completely and created my own curriculum centered around social justice. Um, and I had a couple people come in my classroom and they were like, are you sure you should be teaching students about feminism and civil rights? And I was just like, yes. <laughs> I mean, what is the point of education if it's not teaching you to think critically? That's what I think about education. And so I was just like, if um, if my students aren't learning to think about the world in a critical way, why am I here? Why are they here? So I was just like, I'm just going to do my own thing. It's going to work out. Um, I didn't really know that it was going to work out, but it worked out in the end. So that was good for me. But um, I did that and then um, I had interned in college with the National Women's Law Center in DC and the Feminist Majority Foundation and that's when I found out that Title IX, um, which is Title IX just governs, um, everyone knows that it's like women and girls in sports but it's more than that which I'm constantly telling people. Um, so Title IX covers sexual harassment, sexual assault, sexual violence, um, and discrimination at the K through 12 level. And before I interned at the National Women's Law Center, I didn't know that Title IX operated at the K through 12 level at all. Um, and so I found that out and I was just like, oh my God, this is my thing. So when I started going on interviews after Colby and people were like, oh, what do you want to do um, post grad? Like, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And I was just like, Literally, the only thing I would say, and I guess this is why people are constantly staring at me like I was crazy, but I'd be like, oh, if Title IX were a person, I would totally get married to it right now, which is like not the appropriate thing to always say in an interview, but whatever. I went with it. <laughs> and so that's what I'm focusing on now in law school is um, Title IX litigation. Um, and my dream job, honestly, is like, I'm not always sure I want to be a traditional practicing attorney, but when I think about suing certain places, then I'm like, oh yeah, I should totally do that. Um, so I would love to sue the Baltimore City School District for all of the illegal things I saw them doing with special education students um, and English language learners while I was teaching and to kind of enforce Title IX at the K through 12 level here in Baltimore. Um, and I honestly, okay, 
Last night, I got that email um, that was sent by a better Colgate. Um, did you guys get that email? No. Oh, oh mm, okay. So, I don't know if they send it to current students. I'm not even sure how they got my name because I'm definitely not on board with anything that they do. They're like, um, they're like the they're like the right wing version of the alumni council for Colgate. That's the only way I can describe them. As um, we sent this ridiculous email, and at first it was it was talking about like due process violations at Colgate. So basically, what due process is in um, a equity hearing or a grievance process hearing is that. You have, um, you're required by law to have notice and the opportunity to be heard. And there are several Supreme Court cases that have talked about what notice means, what the opportunity to be heard means. Um, and it's for um, the accused to have those due process rights during the hearing process. And um, another Kobe alum and I are both in law school right now. And so she sent me a Facebook message and she was like, please tell me you saw this email. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't check my Colgate email. I graduated like three years ago. Of course I don't check my Colgate email anymore. Um, and I read it. And at first glance when I read it, I was just like, ooh, if Colgate is really having these due process violations, someone needs to go hold them accountable, which I can't do yet because I haven't graduated. So I need to like turn it on and stop. <laughs> It was like, I read it and I was just like, oh man, if due process violations are really happening at Colgate, um, maybe one day I would come to Colgate and do something about that too. Um, but yeah, I, it's just, I think this is a time where colleges and universities are struggling with how to end sexual assault on their campuses. And I think some of them are going about it in the right way and others just not at all, like they're completely disregarding their legal obligations. Um, so that's the work that I'd like to do one day is to go be like Brett Sokolow and enforce Title IX and the Clery Act on college campuses and universities and make people listen to me and be like, this is really the right thing to do, I'm not kidding, and if you don't do it, you're going to get sued. Um, so before I ended, I just wanted to go over some important parts of Title IX and the Clery Act for you guys. And I wanted to emphasize that if it weren't for um, women's studies, I was a women's studies and political science double major. Um, are there any other political science majors in the room? Okay. Um, so whenever I used to tell people that I was a women's studies and political science double major, honestly, they wouldn't ever ask me about women's studies. They'd just be like, oh, political science, that's great. And I was just like, did they not just hear what I said? I always said women's studies first for a reason. Um, and now that I'm three years out and in law school, honestly, I think women's studies did more for me than political science did. Um, <laughs> and I just like, I don't know what kind of person I would be if I hadn't learned about feminism because I was a hot mess before I got to school. <laughs> and I think it has done help to empower me and help me to think a lot about intersectionality um, and oppression in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, before I came to Colgate, I was, this is so embarrassing, I was um, one of those sad people who would sometimes do the oppression Olympic stuff and learning about feminism and intersectionality helped me to understand that people aren't really living single issue lives in the way that I thought that they were. Um, and it helped me to be outspoken. It helped me a lot in navigating the professional world because, um, you know, statistically women seem to have a harder time negotiating or saying no in the workplace or asking for the things that they want. And so when I first started working at Colgate, I was just like, you know what? I'm not like, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to forge my way and I'm just going to ask for the things that I want. And so I learned how to say no very early on during my teaching career, um, especially when I was saddled with too many things. 
Um, and I learned how to ask for a lot of the same job opportunities that uh, my male colleagues at my school were getting and learned how to fight for myself. Um, so feminism definitely comes in handy. And I know that sometimes it seems like you can't turn feminism or womanism into a career, but you totally can. Um, just more of a, I guess, more of a low-key career. And I feel like in the legal world, there are a lot of um, women and men who are doing work around feminist-oriented issues um, and doing work around queer issues, and I think that's important. Um, and so I just want to encourage all of you guys that I know, like I know that sometimes COVID sucks, and sometimes you can't wait until you leave, um, and sometimes you wonder how you're going to use some of the skills that you've learned out in the real world that is completely possible. Um, and I wish I could bring the entire class of 2012 with me to show you how possible it is, um, because so many of my classmates are out there doing really amazing things right now because of what they learned at Colby. Um, okay, so really quickly, I wanted to go into Title IX and the Clery Act for you guys, because I know that um, there's work being done around those issues at Colgate right now. I'm going to keep it super brief. And to help me, I'm going to use my outline that I just used for my exam at the beginning of the week. <laughs> so constitutionally, like I said, um, accused individuals have due process rights that include notice and the opportunity to be heard. Um, and victims have equal protection claims that they can bring. Um, they can bring Title IX claims. They can bring lawsuits against their college and university. And the two main mechanisms that they can do that through is Title IX and the Clery Act. Um, and Title IX and the Clery Act work, kind of work hand in hand. Um, so the Clery Act outlines um, like security mechanisms and policies that your university should distribute to current students and prospective students and their parents. Um, and some of that includes having a daily crime log that they update with um, any, really any crime that has occurred on Cleary Geography. Um, and Cleary Geography is anywhere on the campus, um, campus-owned property that's off campus and areas that campus safety would patrol. Um, so you have requirements for keeping a daily crime log. You need to have an annual security report. Um, and the annual security report is what Colgate releases every October. It's an annual report, um, and it outlines all of their safety procedures, how they keep buildings secure, what their evacuation plan is in case of emergencies. Um, and the Clery Act was brought by the parents of a student who was raped and murdered at her college slash university. Um, and they really drove home the point that colleges need to have safety plans for how they're going to take care of students. Um, because, you know, since you're a student, your university has a legal obligation to keep you safe um, since you're living there uh, full time. Um, so that's the Clery Act. And then Title IX, which is the one for my life, um, is about not excluding anyone from the education process or education programming on the basis of sex. Um, and it has since been interpreted to include sexual harassment, um, sexual assault, sexual violence. Um, and you can bring a Title IX claim at any point in your education, educational career. So pre-K, 10th grade, 12th grade, college, um, you could bring a Title IX claim as a law school student. Um, in a PhD program, so it kind of runs the gamut. Um, and one thing that not a lot of people know is that Title IX protects pregnant and parenting teens in the K through 12 educational process. So um, I had a friend from high school who, this is what I mean that I need to keep a lid on it. Um, I had a friend from high school who was in a nursing program and she was pregnant and um, her professor wouldn't let her sit for the exam because she was pregnant, which you just, you can't do things like that. And so 
I found out about this and I was like, oh my God, you need to file a Title IX claim. And she was just like, what? And I was like, file a Title IX claim, but don't tell anyone that I told you to do it because I'm not supposed to be giving out legal advice since I'm not barred yet. Um, but I knew it anyway. Oops. <laughs> Um, the thing about Title IX is that it protects you from the K through um, whatever they're calling post-education now, post-high school education. Um, and it also applies to transgender and gender non-conforming individuals. Um, it protects students from bullying, um, which is a part of the reason why I kind of want to sue the Baltimore City School District because they don't have any programming really on bullying prevention work, which just doesn't make sense because it's a school district and school districts know that students bully on a regular basis. Um, but, you know, Title IX covers bullying that involves um, homophobic slurs, bullying that involves slut shaming. Um, it covers all of that. And that's why I would marry Title IX because it's just the most amazing thing on the planet, I think. Um, so, I'm trying to figure out if there's anything I wanted to cover. Um, I kind of wanted to cover affirmative consent, but I feel like that's something that Colgate's already doing with the Yes Means Yes programming. Have you all done Yes Means Yes? Okay, good. Um, because when I was a, we didn't have Yes Means Yes yet when I was a freshman, I don't think. I think we got it my sophomore year or my junior year. Um, and Yes Means Yes is all about affirmative, enthusiastic consent. And that's something that the White House Task Force Against Sexual Assault is really pushing colleges and universities to take on. Um, and at the state level, in Maryland and in New York, um, the state legislatures are trying to push forward having colleges and universities um, incorporate definitions of affirmative consent into there just because it's not a requirement, it's just a best practice. Um, and so a lot of things that colleges and universities are doing now are not doing are really best practices like affirmative consent, um, letting a victim know about their legal rights outside of the school, letting them know that they can um, choose to go to law enforcement, that they can choose to go forward with an investigation or not. That's like some of that is incorporated by Title IX, but most of it are considered best practices for colleges and universities. Um, so I just want to encourage you guys to keep fighting that good fight. And give me like another year and a half. I'm officially halfway through law school. So in another year and a half, if Colgate is not um, complying, please don't hesitate to Facebook me because I will come up to Colgate really quick and talk to um, the president and try to sort things out. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's all that I had to say. And I just want to let you guys know that um, cherish the time that you have in the Women's Study Center. Um, because honestly, when you go out into the real world, people are still going to be saying some really stupid stuff. Um, and, oh, that's a story that I wanted to end on. So, in 2015, I think it's um, completely insane that in my legal clinic that had 15 people, that I was the only person in my legal clinic who openly identified as a feminist. Um, and I had a classmate who, he, oh my goodness, we would just be having conversations and he'd be like, you sound like such a feminist right now. And I was just like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, is that supposed to be an insult? Are you trying to insult me? And he was just like, well, I'm just saying you sound like a feminist. And I was like, oh, I think that's a good thing. You don't think that's a good thing? And he was just like, no, like, I think your viewpoints are really skewed. Whatever. Um, so just, I would say cherish the time that you have in the Women's Study Center because I think right now in college, you're surrounded by so many radical thinking, critically thinking people that um, sometimes you won't find in large numbers outside of the college setting, which is really unfortunate. But the good thing is that you're being, um, you know, armed with skills and tools that you can use to advocate on behalf of whatever it is that you believe in. Um, and for me, that's LGBT rights and feminism um, and civil rights for people of color. Um, 
and you'll find people who will bicker back and forth with you and try to make you feel badly about what you're advocating for. And I just say keep fighting the good fight because um, I think a part of the reason why some of those people come off so defensive is because they can't think critically about those issues um, in the way that some of us can. Um, so yeah, I would say just keep fighting the good fight. Um, are you guys in exams yet? Next week? Oh, good luck. Oh my goodness, I don't miss that part of week at all. Um, good luck with the exams. Um, and, you know, one thing that will help you a lot, I think, is keeping your eye on the prize. I know that's what's helping me now in law school because I'm not surrounded by a lot of radically criti critically thinking people in my law school at all. They're actually really pretty conservative. Um, and the one thing that keeps me going is doing the work that I want to do when I finally graduate. Um, so I would say just keep that. Keep your eye on that prize, and you'll make it through exam week and your junior and senior year, and then you'll be a Yeah. So I don't, I don't have anything else to say. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Are you willing to take questions, Dina? Oh my God! Always, yes, please. <laughs> Yeah, go for it. Um, I don't, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, you talked about how Title IX protects um, people in, like in educational systems, but but for those of us who are graduating from Colgate and then just like gonna start a job, like is there like a, like a federal like Title IX, but that's not for education? Or, like how? Like if if we were working at a company and we wanted to file a type of claim that like would be Title IX if we were at Colgate, what would we do? Okay. Um, you can. So Title IX was kind of modeled off of civil rights, um, uh, civil rights provisions. So you could file a Title VII claim uh, um, that is kind of the non-educationy equivalent of Title IX, um, and. You can file like employment discrimination, and unemployment discrimination would fall like pregnancy discrimination. And for people who are outside of education, you would file a claim through the EEOC, um, Equal Employment Office of Commissioners, Office Office of Commissioners, something like that. Um, and you would file you would file a claim through that. Um, you could file a sex-based discrimination claim, and the EEOC has since. Um, I think since last year has changed sex-based discrimination to incorporate discrimination against transgender and gender non-conforming people um, because the idea is that um, discrimination against trans people is a form of gender discrimination because it's steeped in gender stereotypes about how we should be living our lives. Um, so you would file a claim like that. Um, which happens a lot, unfortunately. Like there was just a case with um, a woman who worked for UPS. She filed a sex discrimination claim. She was pregnant, and they wouldn't let her drive the truck, um, even though she needed it for her economic livelihood. So she filed a Title Seven claim for pregnancy discrimination. Yeah. No problem. Oh, and I would add. I'm sorry. So when you're filing any type of discrimination claim, you have to make out what's called a prima facie case, um, and there are certain elements that you have to fulfill in making the claim. So if you were making a um, sex discrimination claim, your claim would have to include the fact that you're being treated differently from um, your male counterparts who are similarly situated to you. And um, unfortunately, I had a professor um, named Professor Reiner, who was a civil procedure professor, he argued a case in front of the Supreme Court and lost it. And um, because he lost the case, the pleading standard for these cases is really high. So when you're making, when you're filing a complaint, it needs to be as factual as possible and not conclusory, or else your complaint might get thrown out by the court. Um, and so if you are filing a complaint, 
with the EEOC, you would have to include as many facts as possible to have a well-pleaded complaint so that your complaint can continue to move forward in the process. That's the only thing I would say. Anytime you're filing a complaint, even if it's not like a legal complaint, just include as many facts as you can um, because courts really don't like conclusory statements like, I was discriminated against um, Colgate. Like, a court wouldn't want that. They would want facts about why you think you were discriminated against, what happened, who was a witness to the discrimination, how do you know this wasn't due to some other factor other than discrimination. Um, so those things go into filing a complaint as well, which I think that's a part of the reason why sometimes people don't file them. You know, um, it's really tedious and it's a lot of work. The one thing I'd love to work on is um, making, opening up the legal field so that people don't always need to get an attorney to help them do these things. Um, I, I feel like people should be able to access legal knowledge without an attorney. Um, and I say that knowing that if that came to fruition, I wouldn't have a job as an attorney, but I would be completely fine with that. Um, because some of these attorneys out here charge really high fees and don't always do a good job. Um, so yeah, that's how you bring that claim or complaint. Thank you. No problem. Um, um. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> in, so in instances of sexual violence on campuses, for example, is it like legally very kind of dry what the balance is between uh, being survivor centric and offering due process to the accused? Because that seems to be where a lot of confusion is for me anyway, and on in discussions that have been going on on campus lately. It's sort of like where the rights lie and what that can look like legally. Okay. Could someone really quickly repeat that question for me? Because I kind of heard bits and pieces of it, but I want to make sure I heard the entire thing. So he was asking if, um, and correct me, but uh, the difference between so we have we have due process for the accused is part of is part of Title IX, um, but we also on campus we're having kind of this buzzword of survivor centric. So. Am I correct? Like, how can Title IX be survivor centric at all, or are there ways to make sexual assault policy on campus survivor centric if we do have to give um, equal rights or equity to the accused and the accuser? Oh, okay. Um, so I think I do think that um, Title IX has some flaws in that it seems to be very mm, victim oriented in that um, a lot of what comes out of Title IX is uh, stipulations for what should happen during the hearing process for the victim and for the accused. It doesn't really address necessarily what should happen after the hearing process has ended, but I think that it should. Um, and I think, I think it can be, it can be survivor centric on the campus level, but I think that that's work that campus organizers need to do, um, along with campus administrators. Um, so for instance, in the hearing process, if like the victim and the accused should both find out about the outcome of the hearing simultaneously, right? So the accused shouldn't hear before the victim, the victim shouldn't hear before the accused. They need to both hear at the same time and usually through the same method of communication. Um, and the accused, during the hearing process, the school has to give some type of interim measure that could be an interim suspension, um, but then the victim also needs to be given some type of interim measure like a change in housing accommodations, a change in the course schedule, and that's something that um, the White House and the Department of Education suggest should be done equally between both parties to make it very equitable. Um, I think what is coming out of Title IX work now is that there should be some type of ongoing support on the campus for victims of violence, um, which seems like that's what we're trying to have happen at Cody now, is have some type of ongoing support of survivors, which I think is absolutely important um, 
with some of what um, are considered White House best practices and DOE best practices are having um, awareness raising, like awareness raising programs for for volunteers. Um, so yes, yes, yes would fit into that. Bystander intervention programs would fit into something like that, just to teach students about how they have the power to help shift rape culture on college campuses. Um, so I definitely think it can be more survival centric. I just think that's more organizing work than anything else. And the movement um, really across the country to end the rape culture on college campuses came from students. Um, administrations aren't really doing this work by themselves, honestly, because at the end of the day, um, a lot of colleges and universities are still run as businesses, you know, and you would think in an ideal world that a college administration would think of all of these problems and be like, oh gosh, of course we should have bystander intervention training. Of course we're going to have like a sexual harassment resource on campus and we're going to let everyone know who the confidential reporters are and who they can go to. Um, but sometimes administrations don't um, really change until they have something to respond to and they're very reactive in that way um which is why i think college activism is so important and when i was at colgate people were like oh do you really think college activism gets stuff done of course it gets stuff done look at all the colleges and universities that are being investigated by the government right now for their title IX violations there's like over 100 of them and that's because of the work of college students, not the work of um, necessarily administrators spearheading these changes. Um, so I do think that it can be survivor centric. And I like after I have one take home exam left to do before I can like be free of all of this. Um, but after that, I want to come back to Cody to speak with um, some of the people who are doing work on this right now to talk about how um, how we can make that more survivor-centric, because I don't think that's something that the writers of Title IX had in mind when they wrote it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what about extracurricular life for an alum, like keeping feminism alive in your non-professional life? So mm -hmm. reading groups, documentary viewing groups, what do you do in terms of building friendship networks and doing activism, those sorts of things extracurricularly? Okay. Um, so my junior year at Colgate, I got involved with a reproductive justice blog called Abortion Gang. Um, and it was something that uh, arose out of response to George Tiller being assassinated. Um, he was an abortion provider who was killed in his church my freshman year of college. Um, and I hadn't really been thinking about abortion rights before that happened. But after that happened, I was just like, oh, my, I, I went through a lot of phases in college. I was like, I'm going to become an abortion provider. That was a big thing for a while. Um, that didn't necessarily come to fruition. Um, so I started writing for Abortion Gang and I continued writing for them um, through the teaching and up until my first year in law school. Uh, so that was an extracurricular thing I did. And then I found like radical spaces in New York City. Like there was this um, organization called NY Corps um, and it's like a community of rad radical educators. And so I would meet up with them once a month and we would talk about ending capitalism and ending patriarchy and feminism and intersectionality. So that was great because I made friends who thought the same things that I did, but also had a fun outlet once a month. Um, and now in law school here, um, I run law students for reproductive justice. Um, and I found a small community of other radically minded future lawyers um, who kind of want to use law to mess up the system 
if I mess up the system, I actually mean like completely dismantle the system is what we're really trying to do, but you can't always say those things out loud. <laughs> um, so I found that community. Um, I got really active in my local synagogue here, um, doing, because they're trying to do more radical work, but it kind of wasn't working. Um, and so I started going to their events, and I was like, I have a lot of ideas. You should really let me help. Like, I can, you really want to make it radical? I can really make it radical. <laughs> I'm working with them now. Um, and this, like, this is going to sound strange, but when I was at Colgate, I really wanted to play rugby. Um, and I was entirely too scared. Well, one, I was too scared. And at the time, my hair wasn't natural, so my hair was relaxed. And every time I thought about the idea of playing rugby, I was just like, I refuse to roll around in the mud chasing after a ball ever to get my hair messed up. Um, and when I moved to Baltimore, I started playing rugby and I started powerlifting. And it doesn't sound like the most feminist oriented thing, but it totally is because I feel like women who play rugby and women who powerlift are, um, for lack of a better word, some of the most badass women I've been in my life, and I love being around a community that empowers me and uplifts me, um, and we don't necessarily talk about feminism or intersectionality or queer theory or anything, but I like to think that um, by the simple fact that we're infiltrating male-dominated spheres and competing with men and showing men what strong women looks like. Um, I see that as an extension of feminism for me personally. Um, so that occupies my time when I don't have my head buried in my textbooks. Um, so yeah, those are the main things that I do. I think sometimes it can be hard to find feminist spaces um, outside of college. And I know when I first graduated and moved to Baltimore, that was something I really struggled with. And I was just like, oh no, there's no more Women's Study Center. I can't go and eat like some lettered lava cake. I can't lay on this. Well, it, the Women's Study Center looked a little different when I was there. And I used to sometimes like lay on the couch and watch, binge watch Downton Abbey for whatever reason. Um, and I missed those spaces when I graduated. Um, and so I think a big part of transitioning out of college is trying to figure out how you're going to create those spaces or find those spaces. Um, and I have a lot of friends who have book reading clubs that they do, and I really would love to do that, but as law school is already ruining my eyesight, um, I kind of feel like, like I can't read books on my free time anymore because my eyes always hurt. So I listen to them instead. Um, and I don't think it would be as fun to listen to a book on audiobook in a group um, but you can find those spaces, you just have to create them. And sometimes if you go into a graduate program, those spaces will automatically built in, be built in, which is what's great about college. Those spaces are already there. Um, but sometimes it involves just having conversations with people and being like, oh, do I gel with this person? Is this someone I think I could spend some of my social time with and not be angry by all the time, you know? Um, yeah. And having those people are good too. Like I have friends who I don't at all agree with, um, and we're never going to agree. And when I was at Colgate, that was a hard thing for me to wrap my head around. I was like, why should I be close friends with someone who isn't a feminist, you know? Or why should I be close friends with someone who's a Republican? But now, um, after graduating, um, I've begun to understand that sometimes those people help you to be better. You know, and I think it's good to have people who can help to remind you of um, the thought process that the other side is having. Yeah. Um, I think that's important, and I've gotten more comfortable with it now that I'm three years out um, because it would have never been a thing Cody for me. Um, so yeah, I think you can find social spaces there too, and I think. Having people that you don't necessarily agree with helps you grow a little more as a person and as a professional. Yeah. I'm sorry for that loud ding. I have iMessages on my computer and so I'm just I, I was just like, I hope nobody heard that and I hope
Thank you. But you can also, if you guys have them, I'm an open book. <laughs> Um, what do you think of the Safe Act things? <laughs> <laughs> um, at, you mean specifically at Colgate or just across the country? Across the country. Um, you know, I, okay. <laughs> I think, I think sometimes things are really well intentioned. I really do. Um, but I don't always think that well-intentioned things have the best impact. Um, I think with the SAFE Act, at least what I know about it, I like that students have been working with administrators and legislators to have it happen, but I also know that there's a huge backlash about it. Um, and I think some of the backlash, I get some of the backlash, and I think some of the backlash, like here in Maryland, they're doing the affirmative consent um, bill and some of the backlash here seems to be very similar to the backlash for the state back. Um, and people are like, oh, like if we have affirmative consent, that might take away the accused due process rights, which actually no affirmative consent doesn't take away the due process rights of the accused, um, which I almost want to write some of these people a letter and be like, I don't think you know what you're talking about, so let me tell you. Um, but it seems like, I need to do a little more research on the SAFE Act, but from what I know about it, I think it might have been well-intentioned. I just don't know that it will have the right impact that it needs to on the ground. Um, and I think what's hard about navigating things like this on college campuses is the role that um, alcohol plays and how, like the role that alcohol plays on college campuses, I know college campuses already have a problem with controlling the amount of liquor their students are drinking. Um, and I think for some administrators, it seems like it's more of a gray area than it actually is. And while I was at COVID, I thought it was a gray area, but now, um, like with a lot of the affirmative consent laws, you can't consent, like you literally cannot consent if you're incapacitated because of the amount of liquor in your system. Um, and you can, there's no way that you can have an enthusiastic consent when you black out drunk. That's just not a thing. Um, and I think when I was a student, I was just like, oh man, alcohol sure makes things gray and muddy. But now, I'm just like, no, it doesn't. You still can't have enthusiastic affirmative consent. Um, so I think a part of it is trying to navigate those gray areas and trying to um, pass legislation or policies that both support victims and survivors, but also still give the accused their due process rights while also giving victims their due process rights. So I think it's a lot um, that a lot of universities are struggling with and it seems like that's all coming out in the same path. Thank you for speaking with us. It's nice to know life after COVID like continues. It's also cool to like hear how the stuff you learned here um, is applied outside, and also like how how things change even between your entering and our and leaving, and then. To like our being here now. It's just like incredibly hopeful. Nice to like go into exam week and find out. Good, good, good. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Um, yeah, Colgate has definitely changed. I was um, reflecting the other day on how different I was five years ago and how um, I think Dina of 2015 would not have recognized Dina of 2010. Um, cause I'm changing so many ways, which is great. Um, and it's just every time I hear about something happening at Colgate, 
I feel like a part of me is immediately brought back to how I felt my freshman year, and I'm just like, oh my god, if I feel this way and I'm an alum, I can't imagine how current students are feeling there right now. Um, and so, with whatever you guys are fighting on campus, just know that I'm there in spirit, and if I weren't in law school right now, I would totally be there in person and like fighting on all of these issues with you guys. Um, because the one thing that I still can't wrap my head around is, and I feel this way about like a lot of things, like queer issues, um, issues impacting communities of color, um, issues impacting women, why, why the onus always has to be on us to make safe spaces for ourselves. And I feel like when you're on your college campus, you should not have to have the burden of making your campus a good place for you to live and be the person that you need to be and the person that you need to grow into. And so that's what makes me the angriest because your like your college years are supposed to be the best times of your life, you know? And in a lot of ways it can be because you make all these wonderful friends, you learn all these new things, interesting things about yourself. Um, but I, don't, I, I just feel like, like I don't feel like student activists right now should have to be fighting with their college administrations to end sexual violence on their campus. I feel like that's something that the administration should have the burden of doing. Um, and I'm glad that I had those experiences at Colgate, but a part of me was like, oh man, it would have been so nice to just like, not care about anything and just do whatever I'm going to do and go to parties and go watch movies and not be upset by the fact that the movies aren't like feminist enough or don't have to back those kinds, you know, like all that stuff. Um, and like those experiences help you to grow, but like, why can't you just enjoy your life and be safe on your own camp? It just doesn't make sense to me, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, I love doing activist work, I really do, but a part of me is just like, I feel like the burden to end a lot of these um, systems of oppression shouldn't fall on the people who are being oppressed, you know? Um, and hopefully, one day in our lifetime, um, that won't be the case anymore, but I think until that happens, we just have to keep fighting and finding ways to have like radical self-care so we're all completely burn out. Um, and keep doing that work. Yeah. So it makes me happy that you guys are like doing this and doing work on the ground and coming to the Women's Study Center for support and self care and you know. But it'll get better and if you yeah, it'll get better. And when you come out of Kobe, you'll reflect on this time and there'll be some times that weren't great, but then there will be times that were. Um because if anyone had told me that I would have graduated from Colgate, I would have been like, you're lying, because my freshman year, I was just like, I'm so over the school. Honestly, my first year, I was, like, I went to public schools all my life, but when I came to Colgate, the amount of privilege that I saw on the campus didn't make sense to me. I was just like, why are people driving Mercedes? I don't understand why, like, I remember understand it from some guy in um, Kate's library, he was just like, oh yeah, I'm poor. And then I, oh my God, oh yeah, I'm poor. And he was just like, he left his um, receipt that had the gate cash on it, on the counter, and it had like $800. I was just like, oh my God, that <laughs> gate cash was like 15 cents. What is um, And just the amount of privilege. In my freshman year, like I really wanted to transfer out of Colgate. Um, and my freshman roommate, who is my best friend, ripped up my transfer applications and was just like, you're not going anywhere, let's stick this out. <laughs> just like, I, was like, <laughs> I didn't do that and I'm glad, um, I'm glad I stayed. I definitely wouldn't be the person I am today had I not. Um, so, yes, I think Cody will surprise you eventually. Um, and like now as an alum, I meet Cody and people all the time. And I was never really that person as a student who was like, oh my god, you went to Colgate? I go to Colgate. Like, that wasn't me at all. Um, but now I see Colgate alumni everywhere, and I just can't shut my mouth. And I'm like, 
Did you have to go to the Women's Studies Center? <laughs> I, you know, going on this whole long thing. Um, so yeah, being at Colgate will surprise you. It will surprise you and just keep networking. There are a lot of Colgate alumni around the country. There's too many of them. Um, New York has a lot of Colgate alumni. Baltimore doesn't really have that many. I feel like there's like three of us. Um, DC has a lot. So yeah, just keep connected and keep coming to the Women's Studies Center persevering, taking care of yourselves. I know it's a struggle. You'll be done soon. <laughs> You're almost at the end. Um, yeah. <laughs>